Let's maybe start to kick this off with a little bit of a preamble and okay. then we'll dive right into it. I'm Kirk Dieter. I'm the editor of Trout Magazine and the Vice President of Communications for Trout Unlimited. I'm also the editor at Angling Trade Magazine. Uh, with me here is my colleague Brennan Sang, who's our digital director for Trout Unlimited, and he's the air traffic controller today. And uh, a guest of honor, you all know, is our good friend John Girak. And John, uh, a few years ago, was kind enough to, um, we were able to hook up and run the columns in Trout Magazine regularly, what he and Bob White produce. And we are, uh, blessed to have them and then they eventually formed their way into books and we're here to talk about one of those books it's called dumb luck and the kindness of strangers and uh so i have the lucky privilege of asking the first few questions to john and then i'm going to turn it over to all of you and if you have questions as you roll and you want to type them in on the q a brennan will read them out and then we'll get john to to go from there but I don't want to belabor things, but I, I do want to, one thing I've always believed, John, is that there are two types in this business is where I've gone is there's anglers who love to write and writers who happen to fish. Which bucket would you put yourself in and why? Um, I think I'm a writer who likes to fish, if only because... Um, I spent a lot, before I started writing about fishing, I spent a long time trying to be a, a serious writer back in the days when I liked the sound of serious writer. And um, so I was writing anyway, and I was, I, you know, I wasn't great at it, but I at least had some chops when I, um, and I was also fly fishing and I would read the magazines and of course, I wasn't selling my stuff and I wasn't getting paid much. And I, it's finally occurred to me, well, you know, these magazines must pay these guys something. And this is not war and peace. I mean, these are fishing stories. Right. And so I started, right. I started writing them and, and um, selling them and making some money. And that's, yeah. you know, as you know, that's for a writer starting to make money is pretty compelling. Yeah, it gets fun, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I, one of my favorite quotes is that that's from the English literary critic, Cyril Connolly, who said that literature is the art of writing something that will be read twice, and journalism is what will be grasped at once. And having dabbled down both paths myself, uh, you know, I, I, I've always kind of approached it, which hat I'm wearing. Am I going to do this as reporting? Am I going to do this? The mm -hmm. thing that's always struck me as someone who reads your work is that you have an uncanny, an uncanny knack to do both at the same time. In other words, I like to read your stuff over. I have to read your stuff over and over again before we put it in the magazine. Yeah. But I enjoy doing that, and I read it in the book form, too, when it comes. But I also think you have a really good knack of taking things that we're thinking and feeling and boiling them down into a simple thing that makes us slap our forehead and say, wow, why hadn't I thought of that? Or why didn't I turn that phrase that way? And I'll give you an example. And it's my favorite thing that anyone's ever written about nymph fishing in the history of the world. And it, you did it in your last one. And it's, it says, but it was our generation that took nymphing from something a respectable fly fisherman just didn't do to something a respectable fly fisherman didn't do in front of witnesses to a minor tactic that was good for a few extra trout between rises, to a method so effective that some of us saw no reason to fish any other way. <laughs> I think that, that describes the evolution of nip fishing and fly fishing better than anything I've read, and it's done in less than a paragraph. So my question to well, you that... is, do you land on those destination notes? Do you have that, what you described about nymphing in your head and you build the copy into that? Or is that something that you're tootling along on the copy you're writing and you come to your own conclusion and you boil it down and it comes at the end of the writing? In other words, are you driving at that point? Is that something that popped in your head on the river and you wanted to make it an element in your story? Usually not. Every once in a while I'm, I'm driving towards a point, but for the most part, it comes up in the narrative of the story and I can't 
I honestly can't remember, but I can almost guarantee that it wasn't that crisp and succinct in the first draft. Right. So, and as I went back, um, you know, John McPhee tells us the, the, uh, the key to good writing is to say what you have to say clearly in and in as few words as possible. Yeah. So that's, I think that pro that passage you read, I think that probably came about through the judicious application of technique. It was probably much more, much longer and more rambling at one point. Yeah, and I, I, as I edited th down through it a couple of times, I go, no, it's just it's way too long. Made it shorter and shorter and shorter until you get down to the, I don't know if that was one sentence or, or not, but it was close. It was. It was one sentence, but it was well punctuated and it worked just fine. So it, it yeah. was great. Well, that's, yeah. Part of, part of it's just technique. Yeah. So I've got two more quick questions and, and then we'll turn it over to open the, for the, the crowd here that's gathered. But um, number one, uh, have you ever been on an airplane and been walking down the aisle and someone's reading your book? Ever, ever run into someone in a public place? Yeah, that yeah, yeah, it has. Um, maybe not, maybe not on an airplane, but in airports, I've seen people sitting there reading my book. And, and do you say anything or do you just walk by and feel good about it? Or It depends. Uh, I have. It usually goes well. I usually just walk over and say, uh, I heard that's a really good book. <laughs> and then hope they're going to look up and recognize me. And if they don't, then I have right. to say, well, I wrote it, you know. <laughs> well, so let's, but, let's, let's lead into my last one. This book, Dumb Luck and the Kindness of Strangers. A, do you title the book yourself before you turn it in, or do the editors help you with that? And B, tell us a little bit about this book specifically and what it means to you and what, you know, how it rates in the long legacy. Not asking you to be your own critic, per se, yeah. but... And I'm asking you to give us some words on this book, especially. What's the what's the appeal here? Well, gosh, it's hard to say. You know, the the publisher used to. They used to ask me when a book would come out. They'd say, "Okay, summarize the book in 200 words." And I tried it this way and that, and finally one time. I just said to my editor, Bob, if I could summarize the book in a couple of sentences, it wouldn't have to be 70,000 words long. Right? Right. right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I write like a novelist. I, I build detail. I build stories with detail as specific as possible. And then I lay one essay on top of the other. Usually they're linked. There's, you know, the same people or places come back. Um, and yeah, that's I good. like. Go ahead. I'm Go ahead. Finishing, but, well, you you raise a really point, a great point, and that I'm also really impressed always with the humility in your writing, and your ability to make fishing more than fish. Right? It, to me, my personal journey in fishing, it, it's never about the fish as much as it's about the places and the people and the dirty cafes and the roads and the landscapes and the rivers and the weather and all that stuff that makes the, the whole thing. So it's easy to write about a crashing tarpon with rattling gills and all the excitement, but harder to write about the sideways rainstorm when nothing's biting and you're sitting there dripping wet and frustrated, but you somehow still make people want to be standing there right next to you, which is so, so cool to me. I find that really yeah. the great appeal of your writing. Well, there's, there's so much to like about fishing besides fish. Right. I mean, there's the places you go and the people you meet, as you said. Um, and uh, gosh, I, you know, uh, Jim Babb and I, uh, Jim's the former editor of Gray Sporting Journal. Sure. And it tur as it turns out, a very distant cousin of mine. And um, <laughs> we got to be friends because we were in Labrador together. And there was a three day long storm when we couldn't leave the cabin. You literally, it was all you could do to leave the cabin and get over to the lodge to have meals. And so we were stuck in the cabin together for three days. And it was either 
either we were going to kill each other or we going we were going to become friends and we came became friends and that's i don't know that to me is more interesting than going out and catching fish for sure for sure brennan do we have questions that we want to bring up Yeah, so um, the first one we have from uh, Alan Weekly, in, uh, uh, who's joining us from South Africa, um, and he asks, um, the fishing car is one of my favorites. It, it touches on the fly fisherman versus the hardware bass fisherman. Is there a move away from the elitist stigma often attached to fly fishing in your country? Because I believe there is one here. Your snobs are, stiff and, are, are certainly still out there, though. What's your view on this, he asks John. Well, um... I don't know. I think it's still, I think it's still kind of there. I think uh, at least some of the fly fishermen I know think they're a, a cut above other fishermen. And um, some of the uh, gear guys I've met are sort of amused by us and our pretensions. Um, but, you know, it's like so many of these cultural divides you've got now. If you sit down and talk to a guy about catching fish and how you do it and why you do it that way, you probably get along just fine. Uh, my friend Ed Engel and I used to go out to the um, uh, Valentine Wildlife Refuge in uh, northern Nebraska, which is a big bird watching thing, but it happens to have just wonderful bass fishing absolutely great bass fishing and not a lot of people there although some and um we were everybody was gear fishing and we would pull our john bolt back into the reeds and the tules and catch these big honking bass out of little potholes with fly rods and after a couple of days some of these gear guys would come over to us and say what are you what are you boys doing back in there and so we tell them and show them. And uh, we'd say, what are you guys doing out here in all this open water? And they'd show us and it, you know, it was fine. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, at the same time, you know, up in the Northwest, uh, the guys who swing for, for steelhead with spay rods um, sort of don't get along with the guys that use glow bugs and lead. But you know, we both catch fish. They actually catch a few more than we do. But um, it just seems like we get along. But I, but it's it's true. There is that kind of elitist thing. I mean, it goes back to goes back to the early days where fishermen, fly fishermen, just felt they were a cut above. But we're not, of course. How about another question? Yeah, great. Uh, so from uh, John Christensen writes, uh, tell us about your writing habits. Uh, do, you devote a set of, do you devote a set time each day? Do you have a detailed outline of where you want to go? Do you type handwrite? What inspires you? And uh, when you're not fishing, is writing a nine to five job? A couple of packed in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's never been a nine to five job. I tend to on days when I'm not fishing or doing something else useful, I tend to get up in the morning, um, get coffee, lots of coffee, and I'll put in, I can put in four or five hours um, of good writing. And if it's not going well, um, rather than try and make it go well, I tend to go do something else and think about it. I take a lot of walks take a lot of like, you know, mile and a half, two mile walks and just think about stuff. It's a great, it's a great thing to do when you're stuck on a story is just go take a walk, think about something else for an hour or two. And a lot of times when you get back, it's just, and, and read up to the point you were stuck at, it's obvious where it goes. So that, you know, like by the time I finished the book, uh, my mind is mush, but my legs are like leaf springs. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't work from an outline. I have, excuse me. And um, there are a few kinds of 
a few kinds of stories were an outline were tip, typically journalism where you just you've got a set of facts you want to convey and you need to do it in a in a fairly short space but for essays i tend to um i tend to work on a complete stream of consciousness level where and i you know and it's it isn't isn't so much a conscious decision is that i just think that's how we think we don't very few of us think in a straight line. We think like a dog on a walk where we go here and go he'd go there and sniff this and maybe go back and sniff something we again that we sniffed half an hour ago. Um, it's how we it's how we think and it's how we go through life anyway. So that's how I tend to write the stories. I hate I hate knowing where a story's gonna go and aiming for that because you like you get a great last paragraph, but the whole rest of the story is kind of stilted and artificial. I'd much rather just start, find a good place to start, a good lead, see where that takes me, and then see where that takes me until I, um, I don't know, I begin to begin to have a sense of where I'm going. Um, the reviewer wants wrote that he liked my essays, but it could be two thirds of the way, he said he could be two thirds of the way through before he figured out what one was about. And I remember thinking, well, that's about where I am when I figure out what it's about. So that's fair. It was actually pretty uh, a pretty good comment. <laughs> that's cool. Let's keep them rolling. Yeah. So um, Phil writes, um, and he quotes here uh, from the book. The quote is, uh, they say getting older is a process of elimination. And I wonder if we eventually start defining ourselves solely in terms of what we won't do. And it ends the quote there. And he says, uh, I'm 65 and that resonated with me. What won't you do in it won't, won't you do anymore in, when it comes to fishing? Well, uh, first I'll say at 65, you're a kid, but, um, what won't I do? Well, you know, that was, that was a specific reference to something. I can't remember what it was, but that was kind of a specific reference to something. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe trying to catch a bazillion fish or something. Um, is in terms of fishing, I, I, there's very, very few things I just refuse to do as long as they're legal, but, um, and actually I, I'm kind of interested in going someplace where they, where the locals do things differently and trying it that way, because there's usually a reason why they do what they do. And if you can make it work, then it becomes part of your, part of your tool bag. But, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, but, um, one thing I one thing I did uh, quit doing was elk hunting a couple of years ago because I just could not do the physical work. We we used to hunt a a section that was just rough as a cob, and uh, I just got to where I couldn't lift those quarters anymore, and I couldn't get up the mountain like I used to, and so uh, I finally and that you know that's a that's a sad moment, but it has to happen. And I'm not the first guy in his early 70s who said, well, that's the last one of those big sons of bitches I'm going to haul off of a mountain, you know. Thank God the guys I, I hunted with still cut me in on the meat, which is very nice of them. That is good. Jim asked, what's still on your bucket list, John? <sighs> Boy, um... There's a few things uh, I'd like to do. I'd still like, I've never caught sea trout, sea run browns. And I'd like to do that. Uh, of course, there's a bazillion fish I haven't caught. Saltwater doesn't interest me too much. Um, oh, I've done a little bit. Uh, I'd like to go to, I think I'd like to go to Iceland. I've heard good things about that. Um, and I, it, it's, it strikes me as a place that would be 
fun to fish even if the fishing wasn't exceptional because of just the the landscape and the people and um the culture that's that's there it's kind of the it's kind of a remnant of the pure viking culture that that's still out there in the world and uh, you know they're they're inventive funny um, non-violent people who mostly like to fish and it just seems like a good place to go it's just There's a few things yeah. like that i tried to catch long nose gar on a on a fly mm -hmm. rod and couldn't and i wouldn't mind giving that another another shot and that's that's closer than iceland they do that around wichita sure <laughs> ron also asks if you could only fish one place where would it be and why like you're just stuck at one place you know i get that question if you could only fish one place if you can only fish one fly you only fish one rod if i could only fish one place with one fly and one rod i just i'd quit i'd get I'd take up golf I, you know, I'm fascinated by the different places and the different fish and different subcultures you run into and big water and little water and lakes and ponds and all that stuff. I, if I had to fish one place, I just, I probably get, I probably would eventually get bored. There are a few places I fish all the time, year after year for you know, 40 some years, but that doesn't mean I'd like them to be the only place. Brendan, anything else on your end? We got some more questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. You've had a couple of folks uh, write uh, about Tenkara, uh, including uh, Frank Phillips, who asks, uh, uh, since your interview with Daniel Gerardo or Gelardo, have you done any, have you, uh, do you have any further thoughts on Tenkara? Well, I suppose I have some thoughts, you know, um, for some reason, I, that was a case of, of doing my due diligence as a, as a journalist. I, um, when that first hit ancient, ancient method of fishing, but when it first hit in the U.S., it was something new and you know there aren't that many new things in fly fishing so i kind of jumped on it and um i got a rod i learned to use it i spent uh, the better part of a high country season which is only six eight weeks long fishing exclusively with a tankara so i could learn how to how to do it and i just i didn't want to I didn't want to go out and fish one for an afternoon and write the definitive story about it. I wanted to actually learn how to do it and do it for a season. And I ended up going out and fishing with Daniel and uh, he showed me a few things. It's not, it's so easy that you don't really, you don't really need much instruction. If you, if you fish, if you fly fish anyway, it's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory. So I wrote the story and then it got around that I was a big Tenkara guy. But the fact is, after I wrote the story, I put that rod away and never did it again. Except for one time, uh, I went fishing with Daniel and I thought it would be polite to use a Tenkara ride. So I took one. But that's my thoughts on Tenkara. I, I think people who, who get into it, I think it's a, I think it's a great thing. I, I'm... I kind of admire that I'm going to fish one fly on one rod, take it or leave it. Uh, it's all presentation and action. You know, I'm not going to depend on a bunch of flies, but I just like flies too much. And I like reels and I like all the diverse stuff that you fuss around with when you're fly fishing. So I could really never, I could really never, get into it that much. Sure. Um, have you ever gone to a place and you don't have to name the place or but it, it just turned out that it, it just didn't jive and you, you thought you had a story going in and it just didn't pan out and you didn't write about it after all. Oh, yeah, sure. That happens. 
And mm -hmm. uh, since, since this is how I make my living, it just means I have to go fishing again right away. Somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's rare. It's rare. I'll add two things to say about that. It's rare that something didn't come up that will get used later as an example of something or other. Like the kind of guide you want to avoid at all cost or you know, some terrible mistake you never want to make. That'll, that can come up. And the other thing is, one advantage a writer has over a normal fly fisherman is that a trip that goes right in the crapper can be a great story. It's not, a, it's not always a fun trip, but one of those trips where absolutely everything you touch turns to crap uh, can be pretty fun once you get over the sting of it and get home and see the, the humor in it. It can be a good story. That's right. So following up on that, Jim has just asked, you know, do all your trips have the same story potential or do you know that some are work trips and others are kind of fun trips that might turn into something off the clock? like you said. Well, um, yeah, I, yeah, kind of. I mean, most of the fishing I do around home becomes, in my mind, it just becomes part of a process. Um, up until a couple of weeks ago, like a week and a half ago, I was fishing a blueing olive hatch on a t uh, tailwater near here. It was on for about a month and um, you know that becomes a uh, that becomes a, a, a month of fishing every couple of days and then that becomes 20 or 30 years of fishing that river and but it's not specifically a story but then if I saddle up and go to Labrador or Alaska or excuse me, a steelhead river somewhere, or Atlantic salmon fishing. Uh, I have a story. I have, I, I aspire to write a story. And generally you get one. I mean, I have been doing this for over 40 years. I kind of know how to get a story <laughs> out of a trip. But I really try to I really try to go, just go fishing for the same reason anyone else does, just to see what will happen, see new place, and see what happens. And um, if there's a story in it, there's a story in it. But it's pretty hard to go, especially if you go to Labrador or Alaska and pile on a de Havilland beaver and fly around and look at moose and grizzly bears and catch salmon and I, you know it's pretty hard not to get a story out of that true quite true brennan do we have any others yeah so um eric diltz right um as you said you like flies uh, i think this is kind of a fun one if you were a fly what kind of fly would you be oh probably be i'd probably be a a, a dry fly I'd probably be a uh, split wing, collar hackled, cat skill style dry fly. Just for old time's sake. What's your favorite fly name of all time? Um, I think, uh, you know, it might be it's the pink no ass. You know the pink no ass? No, but I'll have to look it up. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, Bob White was just telling me uh, about a fly called the thing from Uranus. That's another good one. It's a stone fly. Yeah, speaking of Bob, he's your partner in crime on a lot of this stuff. And uh, it's been, you guys have had a great collaboration over the years. Can you fill me in a little bit about how that all came about and, and you know, how you met and how this gelled and all that? Uh. Well, we, um, you know, I was aware of Bob. He's, he's been doing this. He's, he's been all over the sporting press for years, decades. So I was familiar with his work, thought it was pretty good. And um, the first time we worked together was probably 30, 
33 to 35 years ago, I wrote a story in um, Fly Rod and Reel, and they illustrated it with a Bob White painting, which I really liked. And then when I took on that column, the Lee Wolf used to write the back page column. When he, he died, they offered it to me. And Bob came on as the illustrator, and we still hadn't met. So he was he had illustrated a, a year or two's worth of columns, I guess. I I maybe maybe it was more than that. And finally I we, we met. I, I went out of my way to meet him at a, a sportsman show and hit it off. You know, I liked him, I liked his wife Lisa. Uh, I've always liked his work. And from there on we just um, kind of slowly and, and steadily became friends and uh, started fishing together and stayed at each other's houses and you know and the more I the more I got to know him the more I liked him he's, he's really you, you know him he's a sweet guy he's one of the nicest guys he loves um, and he's he's one of the best guides I've ever been with yeah he's really good too he's, you know he's like he's guided in Alaska for 30 some years it's a real deal. Yeah, the idea is the real deal for sure. Okay, Brendan. Any uh, others? We got. I know there's a lot actually, so keep on rolling. All right. So uh, Steve LaFalse writes: um, What importance does the history and ethos, i.e., Hanford and Skews and Gordon et al. Uh, of fly fishing, have in your have in your writing? Is there a sense of distinct specialness of the sport that informs your writing? Well, I'm, yeah, I was, I came up in fly fishing at a time when people knew about that history. And, um, you know, all those old English guys and, you know, they knew that Skewies was the, the first guy to fish nymphs as opposed to wet flies. He fished them as nymphs, tied the first fly that you would recognizes a nymph with a wing case and and all that Halford was uh was an insufferable dry fly snob and and you know some of us enjoyed that but uh the the one the one comment I have about that is it seems like a lot of the guys and women who come into it now don't know that stuff and and aren't interested. You know, they just want to, they want to pick it up in the present and do it and, uh, and then go snowboarding or uh, I don't know what. So, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's, it steeps you in this tradition. You get to see that, you know, the, at least in England, they were been doing this for 500 years and, um, Gosh, in Japan, they've been doing it for more like a thousand. And then, uh, God, they were fishing with a, a, a hook and, or a, a rod and line in Egypt, for Pete's sake. I mean, it, you know, ancient Egypt. So it goes back away. And, and it's, um, God, uh, Marcus Aelianus wrote about fly fishing in uh, the third century. And it was... Um, and it was purely from a practical standpoint. They were they were fish eating flies floating on the water. They couldn't. The flies were too fragile to hook on a, a hook as bait, so they started tying stuff on the hook to mimic the the fly. And um, and I mean this this wasn't this wasn't uh, the niceties of sport. This was just uh, people wanting something to eat and and using their ingenuity to catch fish. Wow. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting to know how far back it goes. And that was one of the, when I first started uh, fishing with a fly rod, that was one of the things that really stuck out to me being and always being an avid reader, uh, reading uh, it, some of your stuff was some of the first stuff that I found, but finding all of that, that huge cannon around, around the sport, just, um, felt anchoring as, as someone coming into it. It was, it was really impressive to, to see 
really started anything that already had this huge body of, uh, of, of essays and thought behind it. It was, it was pretty impressive. Um, I, I have a, another question uh, about books uh, from Gregory Prozen, who says, uh, there appear to be a lot of books behind you, uh, surely not all fishing books. What do you enjoy reading when there are no fish on your brain? Um, you know, I read a lot of novels and I read a lot of short stories. Um, I don't read, honestly, I don't read much about fishing unless it's by someone I really, really know I like or if there's something I'm trying to find out. I'll, um, I'll do research in fishing, but mostly I'm interested in writers who are really good, uh, really good writers and, and learning about writing. I can, I can learn about fishing easily enough. So I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in learning about writing. The, my, my dream writer is someone like Tom McGuane or Craig Nova, who's a really good novelist who writes about fishing? Uh, and uh, Craig Nova's uh, Brook Trout in the Writing Life, Tom McGuane's The Longest Silence. I mean, those are just magnificent books that I go back and read over and over again. And I go back, I still even go back to Hemingway. I read a lot of Hemingway short stories because I just like his, his I, I mean, it's, He's almost, a, he almost reads like a self-parody now because he really is pretty easy to parody. But, you know, he, most of his writing today wouldn't write the way we do if it weren't for Hemingway coming along and bringing that whole journalistic sensibility into it. I mean, before Hemingway, most people wrote like Victorian uh, lawyers and and now they write like Hemingway. Even people who don't like Hemingway write like Hemingway. <laughs> John, do you ever read your own book? I mean, you have to read the chapters as you're making them over and over and over again. But when it comes in the box and it comes to your house and you open it up and you smell the ink, do you sit in a big easy chair and start reading it from front to back? Or are you already on to the next project and, and you don't necessarily read through your own book? I've never gone back and read one of my own books cover to cover. Um, and frankly, I mean, I haven't read this new one. I get it. I look at it. It's got a Bob White. I don't know if you can see it. Got a Bob White painting on the cover. It's a beautiful book, really nicely produced. But I'll tell you a secret. I, I edit so much. I go over things so many times and I go over them again and I reorganize the chapters and I, I probably read that book 40 times. And by the time it shows up in book form, I'm right. sick of it. Right. You know, the you know. trick, the trick is to send it into your editor just before you're sick of it and throw it away. <laughs> That's right. And so, and, but then I'll go back I'll, something will jar my memory. I'll think of a story and I'll go back and say, I wonder if that story is as good as I think it was or something like that. Sure. Or, or sometimes I, if I'm trying not to repeat myself, I'm writing along and trying not to repeat myself. And it, sometimes I'll, I'll say something and go, damn, I, I really think I've said that somewhere. I might go back through a book or two just to see if I've said it recently. Yeah. yeah. It's, and you know, it's okay to, to repeat yourself as a writer, as long as you didn't, as long as you just didn't say it like last week or in the last book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How about another question, Brennan? Yeah. So, uh, Carrie Gubitz, I, I'm sorry if I mangled that name there, uh, said, Probably like everybody, I have places where I think the trout are just gorgeous, like jewels and precious stones. For example, the cuts in Trapper's Lake and the spawning brookies in Labrador just knock me out. What are your favorites? Hmm, good question. Well, um, 
spawning spawning West Slope cutthroats in the Elk River are are exceptionally pretty. Um, spawning brook trout you can't beat. And any any salmonid that's in spawning colors is is pretty spectacular. Except you know the salmon are just uh, with the salmon it's different. If they if they're fresh they're just like a chrome bumper. They're just shiny and silvery. Um, God, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I, I just think all fish are any 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 species of fish that I've seen in you know in its natural habitat, wild. I mean, not hatchery fish, but wild fish, just strikes me as gorgeous. But you, you are right about those brook trout in uh, in Labrador. They're awful pretty. It helps that they're so big. That helps too, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so moving into so, some gear stuff, uh, Neil Snyder uh, writes, uh, he says, Mr. Garak, you're well known as an aficionado of bamboo fly rods. How do you view fiberglass, uh, both current and vintage? And do you fish with fiberglass rods? Well, no, I don't. Um, I, I fish a lot with uh, bamboo. I fish some with uh, graphite, and uh, you know my first my first fly rod, my first Granger fly rod was a a glass rod. But I think that's the last glass rod I've ever owned. I've cast some newer ones. They're fine. Uh, some of them are are real nice. I just don't. I mean, I've you know going back. Uh, the big decision is like if I'm going to fish an eight and a half or nine weight, six weight, do I want it to be graphite or bamboo? And I really don't need a third choice. And I sh sure as hell don't need any more fly rods than I already have. So I've just never gotten into them, but uh, that's not to say anything against them. I have some friends who are into them and, and like them a lot. Nice. Um, Mike Sepalak writes in asking if you have any advice for, for new writers. Well, yeah, I would have had advice for you in 1970, but I'm not sure how you do it now. Back then it was, there were, there was no internet. There was none of this stuff and everything was in print and they understood that they had to pay you for the stories. And so, you know, you could kind of break in and, and make, I don't know if you'd call it a living at first, but you could make some money writing. And now with everything online, I'm, I'm just not sure how people make money. I know they do. I'm just not sure how they do it. So, um, I don't know. I hate to, I hate to just blow the question off, but I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been in, in print for so long that, um, and there's still enough print magazines in business to, to support me, but I don't really know how I'd break in now, but, but it can be done. I mean, there's always going to be people telling stories and other people wanting to hear them and, but you'll, you'll have to figure it out or ask somebody younger. Mike, Mike is a very good writer. That's for sure. And he's always welcome in Trout Magazine. So yeah, well, there you go. A loaded question from Mike. You got another loaded question for me, Brennan? Yeah, um, we've got uh, Rob, Robert Krigler wrote in, uh, he wrote that uh, Fish Dogs was uh, a, a fine chapter. And he was asked, he asked if you could uh, share a name and maybe a story of one of your best uh, four legged fishing buddies. Well, I, most of them are, are in that chapter. Um, I've been, I mean, that's one of those, you know, turning a bad trip into a good story. You know, about half of those stories about dogs you wish you hadn't gone fishing with. But um, I always like my, my friend, uh, Vince Zonick, who's a rod maker among other things, had this great dog named Gabe. And uh, Gabe and I were just pals, and 
he was a good guy. And uh, I remember one time he, uh, we have a little lease up on a, a creek near here, We've got a, about a mile of stream. Not a great creek, but it, it's, uh, you know, nobody else can go on it, which is nice. And I was parked there uh, along the, the county road. And I was down in there fishing in this really willowy thick stretch. And Vince was going by, he was coming down from Estes Park or something, and he saw my car. So he thought he'd stop and say hello. Well, I had no idea it was there. And he was coming down the way we always come to get to this one good, good pool. And um, he said, as soon as Gabe got my scent, he just took off. And so here I am all by myself, I think, and this brown furry thing bursts out of the willows right next to my head. And I just, I, you know, I almost lost it. I probably screamed. And it was Gabe, and he just wanted to say hello and get a treat. I always carry, uh, I always carry uh, dog biscuits for him. Oh. So that's it. I, you know, Gabe's not with us anymore, and I, I miss him a lot. He was a good guy. Yeah. That's, that's tough with dogs. They, yep, it's, it's, it's a rough one. Um, we've had a few folks, uh, after, you wrote, after you mentioned that you, you like, uh, you read a lot of novels, a few folks have asked if you've ever considered uh, uh, writing a novel uh, or longer form stuff or, or fiction. You know, I've written a couple of short stories uh, over the years. I, uh, you know, I wrote a couple of fishing kind of fishing related short stories and published a few of them here and there. Um, and I actually wrote a few, uh, a few more, say, uh, traditional short stories at one point. Um, I don't think it's my form. I think I'm. I think I'm a nonfiction guy, what John McPhee calls a factual writer, and um, it's. I think there's too much. There's too much information when you can make anything up. Anything can happen. And my default is well, what actually happened, and how can I how can I tell that in a compelling way, but when I can make things happen. Um, I, I don't know what to make happen, because I'm kind of a journalist at heart. Yeah. Um, to, to touch on that, um, someone else asked, let me make sure, uh, Aaron Sickles asked, if you, uh, if you take detailed notes as things happen, or do you, uh, do you get back home and reflect on a fishing trip afterward uh, when you write your articles or books? Well, I do both. I take notes um, on trips, and mostly it's pure nuts and bolts things like what guide was I with what day? What's the name of the river? How is, if the river is the Agulawak, how do you spell it? If the, uh, if the volcano that's smoking on the horizon is the Chiganagak volcano, how do you spell that? Um, and incidentally, what languages are those words? Uh, you know, they could be Athabascan or Yupik or Inuit or Inu or... So it's all stuff like that. And the names of flies and uh, if you're in a particularly compelling boat I was in, uh, up on the Miramichi, I was fishing out of a 22-foot uh, wooden canvas white canoe, brand name White. Beautiful boat, and I so I needed to find out, you know, I had to quiz the guy on what is this boat and who builds them and why is it like, why is it 22 feet long and why is the anchor pulley in the front instead of the back and and uh, so it's a lot of that stuff. And then if I get, uh, oh, in quotes, if somebody says something good, I use a lot of quotes because people, uh, 
people say, especially when they're relaxed and you've been fishing for a couple of days and you're tired, it, sometimes people just say exactly what they mean. Um, you know, like politicians who just let it down for a minute and actually just tell the truth. And I always write that stuff down, anything like that. And if I think I have a great literary idea, I'll, I'll write it down. But it's amazing how often I get home and that stuff just reads like, like greeting card copy. It's, it, you know, it just, in the heat of the moment, it sounded good, but back home, it's just, yeah, well, of course. And, uh, and then I'll, then I will typically within a day or two, I'll transcribe those notes while they're still fresh and while I can still read my own writing, which is a big problem. Cause I mean, some of this stuff is in pounding boats or on airplanes or whatever. And, uh, as I'm transcribing the notes, I will remember things I didn't write down, impressions I had, um, maybe descriptions of people, things like that. So I'll just put all my notes and everything else I can think of down on paper. Actually, anymore, it's on a, on a file on a computer. And then I'll put it away and I'll think about it. And uh, usually, usually I'm working on something else anyway, and it'll come back into my mind. And if I get a different idea, I'll go back and maybe I'll start to think I know where the lead is, like where the, where the door into the story is going to be. So I'll go back and find that, put it on the top with an asterisk next to, next to it. And I'll just pick away at it and try to leave it until uh, the trip's kind of history. And then I'll go back and start the story. I don't like to write them when they're real fresh. Oh, well, sometimes you have, you're on deadline, you have to. But typically, it's, typically I have to think about them for a while before I think what, what the story really is about or what it, really was that I learned or something a little spark somewhere that gives me an idea where to start. I'm not organized. I'm not a very organized writer. I could turn this computer around, show you my desk right now. And it would, it would tell you all you need to know. I think, uh, we've got several more minutes. So if there's last call for questions. Oh, Kirk, are you talking? I think I you am. might be muted. Am I unmuted now? Not, you're not yeah, muted all good. me. All good. Okay, good. So I was saying there's several more minutes. I think that we're going to want to wrap this up in about an hour. So if there's a couple other haymaker questions that we want to ask, let's get on them. Yeah, so um, we've got a, a, a couple of, of, of uh, specific bamboo questions uh, here that, 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 that could be uh, quick or or could be uh, or could be rather deep. But um, Wes Presnell asks, uh, "What your favorite bamboo taper is for smaller streams with seven to?" Um, well, I, I you know I can't tell you the taper. I can tell you the I, I can give you a couple of rods. I've got a a. Um, Walter Babb, seven foot nine inch, four weight. It was, uh, and I know he built that on a, he took a, I wanted a four weight, but I wanted it seven nine. So he took a seven and a half foot, two piece pain taper, added the extra inches and then re-engineered, re-engineered it for two ferrules instead of one. And that is a magnificent rod. That's, I, I love that rod. Um, I, I sort of have, I like it so much, I have to force myself to fish some of my other rods occasionally because I'm going to wear it out. Uh, lately, I've been fishing a, uh, an old Granger eight and a half foot four weight favorite. Actually, they, 
most people think it's a five weight, but I think I, I like it with the four weight. Um, that's an old sort of 1950s or 60s rod. Granger was, uh, the Granger company was just up the road from me in Denver and uh, maybe 50 miles away. And so when I was starting out in bamboo, you know, every third or fourth yard sale, sale you went to had an old Granger bamboo rod for 25 bucks. So I, I picked up some really nice ones. And I've got an old Charlie Jenkins eight foot four weight that I really like too. Um, part of that sentiment, but uh, cause I really like Charlie. And, uh, but it's, it's, it is actually a wonderful rod too. Those are a couple. I mean, we could be here all night if you want me to describe all my bamboo rods, but some people would get bored. A few so, of us um, and some we had, uh, so we can, we can. There's one question here that uh, you were asking me about, Brennan, but um, uh, Len asks if there's any memories of fishing in Michigan specifically that you would like to share. And uh, that's a loaded question because Brennan's in Michigan right now and I'm from Michigan and and one of my favorite essays of yours, John, was up in Michigan. So, uh, John, why don't you answer that question? Yeah, well, I've had some really good times fishing in Michigan. I, I need to get back. Uh, I need to go out and fish Michigan with you, in fact, and, and Brennan, too. But the last time I fished up there was, uh, was with a friend of mine who since died. And he was he was on his last legs and uh, so I have you know they're fond memories but they're but they're not entirely good and I, I need to just go back up there again and, and fish. Well you're always welcome and you know, this, since the question was kind of all panelists uh, you know I'm, fr I'm fr from and I learned to fly fish on the Baldwin River in Michigan and so it's always my home. My answer to the, if you could fish anywhere, you know, you had one day to fish, it would be back home in, in Baldwin, Michigan. Yeah. So any other questions, Brennan? Do you want to get to a couple more real quick? So sneak them in. Uh, yeah. So let's see. And you know, uh, it was a little more writing stuff. A few people asked if there are any uh, instructions writing that you like. Uh, say that again. If you like any instructions. Sorry about that. Uh, Rod Emery. Yeah, writing and instructional books on writing. Yeah. Um, the last good one I read was by John McPhee. I know I keep bringing him up, but he's, he's a wonderful writer. Uh, wonderful book on, on writing called uh, Draft Number Four. Um, McPhee, I, I got into McPhee a long time ago and I never paid much attention or knew what his process was like, but it turns out it's a lot like mine except he's much more organized and, and, and he's got it much more codified, but what he'll do now, he does it on a computer now, but in the old days, he had one whole wall of his office was a cork board and he had three by five cards and he would every, every anecdote, every item in his notes, he would write down on a three by five card and you get a stack of them like this. And he would just shuffle through them until he found a place he wanted to start and he'd put it up in the upper left-hand corner. And then he'd go, well, what, what comes next? And he'd shuffle through some more and he'd find something that logically came next and he'd put that up. And pretty soon he'd have it all up there in order. He'd pull it off and write his first draft from that. And that's kind of what I do, except without the discipline of the cards. I, I just look at all the elements of a story, 
including what it made me think of uh, or or remember from other things. And uh, and that's I'll find my way in somehow, and I'll piece piece them together in the same way. We don't end up with the same. He's much more of a strict journalist than I am, but um, but we we write in the same way, and it just it fascinates me. And yeah. uh, my God, he's he's one of those guys who he writes about anything and everything. I mean, he's like he's got a He's got a real soft spot for canoeing. He likes to fish, uh, all that outdoorsy stuff. He likes Alaska. He likes float planes. But, I mean, he's written about farmer's markets. He's right. written about geology. Yeah. Um, you name it. And he can, I mean, I didn't think anybody could make the running of a farmer's market fascinating, but he did. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, it's called giving good weight. Giving good weight. Giving good weight refers to, which is another another nice thing about titles. It refers to you know, if somebody wants a dozen peaches, you give them thirteen. That's known as giving good giving weight. Good weight. Yeah, exactly. Well, you've given all of us great weight, John, in this last book of yours called "Dumb Luck and the Kindness of Strangers." I appreciate you having been here with us for an hour. I hope we can do it again. Sometimes you we'll come back. I appreciate all of you who have been here to listen in. This has been a great, this is our trial run. We just kind of gave it a, a whirly gig in this crazy time now, but thank you, Brennan, for all that you've done to pull this together. Thank you to Simon and Schuster. Thank you to John, everybody. We'll, let's do this again. Let's not just make this a once every time you write a book thing. Let you come back and let's, let's kick the, kick the fishing stuff around with the gang. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. It was fun. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all. I'll stay safe. Fish well. Thanks again. And it's a, a lot of fun to have you here. Be well. All right. Good night.